Dr. Mung Xu is an assistant professor for, uh, at the University of Maryland in Aerospace Engineering uh, with a joint appointment at the Institute for System Research. Uh, the title of the talk is Certification of Autonomous Vehicles, a Regulator-Oriented Approach. So please, Professor Xu, uh, the scenario is yours. Great. Thank you so much um, to the organizers for inviting me. This is um, uh, really great. I, I looking forward to the day when we can actually all do this in, in person. Um, so this is a little bit of a, uh, a detour from the talks that you will probably be hearing, that you have heard and will probably be hearing for the rest of the session. There, um, I believe, is not a single equation in here, which um, gives me a little bit of um, a, a heart palpitations. Um, but um, it, I'm actually today talking about um, certification for autonomous vehicles um, and talking about it from a, a regulator oriented approach. So this is um, a fairly recent work that I have done um, mostly with my uh, for, uh, a PhD student, um, Dr. Donald Costello, who actually defended this past October. Um, he is um, actually a commander in the Navy currently, um, or was when he was uh, getting his uh, PhD with me. Um, his call sign is Bucket, so I might refer to him as Bucket throughout the the, um, the talk. Um, but really, this is this is work on thinking about how how the um, uh, approval process for certification um, for for any large system autonomous system could happen, um, and where sort of the the formal methods community or academic community might come into play in it. So one of the the fundamental challenges about regulating autonomy or autonomous systems is that we really don't have a good idea about how do you translate what we do now, which is regulating people, to what we need to do, which is regulating systems. So from again, from the regulator-oriented approach, that's kind of the idea. So most, if not all, systems that rely on sort of human reaction do so by testing a person's knowledge or a pilot's knowledge um, and their judgment. So think of a driver's test for your car or pilot's licenses where you need a certain number of hours and then the pilot needs to prove that they're able to fly um, under certain conditions. We don't really know how to measure knowledge or judgment of a system. And so we either need to understand how to do that or how to figure out an alternative approach by thinking of what's a proxy for judgment. And so either way, there's work to be done in that particular realm. And so this is kind of a, a top level perspective about how to do that. And we're gonna think about it through the perspective of a, um, um, a, a large sort of naval system. Okay, right. so uh, very, very, very quick bio, um, just to kind of give you the background uh, from our different perspectives. So I um, uh, received my PhD in 2013 from Caltech. Um, I uh, sort of did work in, in sort of within formal methods, within um, reactive synthesis, um, uh, worked with Nejmier, uh, uh for a couple of years, sort of cross paths there. Um, so my background is in mechanical engineering and aerospace engineering. I'm currently an aerospace engineering professor at University of Maryland. I have a joint appointment with the Institute for Systems Research. So my work thinks about large scale systems and how do you propose them? How do you think about the correct of these systems. So Bucket um, is a 20 year career military officer. So he um, received his PhD in October in mechanical engineering. Um, he's a developmental test pilot. So he basically teaches um, pilots how to fly and he flies experimental aircraft. Um, he flew the Growler for a long time. He has an acquisition background, has done six deployments, over 2,200 hours and 30 types of aircraft. Um, so this is an image of him flying over Afghanistan in a growler in 2013, and then his official um, photo for the Navy. So uh, I, I say this to sort of point out that he has a lot of experience within naval acquisitions. I have experience within sort of the formal methods um, uh, realm. And so this work here is kind of the combination of both, although it sets up a nice um, uh, niche for, for folks in academia to kind of um, work their way into this this sort of uh, approval process that um, we've sort of gotten feedback from the Navy on and, and things that uh, in terms of things that they would find appropriate um, in order to approve an actual system. So currently when a naval aviation system is clear for use, it's assumed that there's going to be a human in the loop that's responsible for its use. And that's kind of the only way that things are, are, are able to fly. Um, there's sort of, um, a difference between automation and autonomy, which I'll sort of um, uh, the, 
with keywords that I sort of talk about throughout the, the, the talk. And so within automation, you can think of pilot relief modes like autopilots that allow the user to do tasks while operating the system. While autonomy is more uh, along the lines of if you're given a, a, this, a task, it will determine the best way to complete it. Um, and then there's the notion of sort of deterministic or non-deterministic um, uh, actions, which deterministic is, as you would imagine, where you're, if you're given a set of conditions, the actions that a system can take um, are known or determined. And non-deterministic is uh, given some parameters, the outcome can, can't really precisely be predicted sometimes or determined. So why do we want to think about autonomy for naval systems or for any system really in general? And within the DOD, um, a huge um, majority of the expense of operating system comes from training its crews um, on the use of that system and then the constant upkeep of training these crews as well. So if that training aspect can be removed then the cost savings are going to far outweigh the extra expense of certifying any new system. So we might think of these this certification process as really long, but um, it, it pales in comparison to um, the amount of money and time it takes to train pilots and to train crews to, to, to operate these systems. And so the thought, that's their thinking, the thought behind it is that uh, it will save us money really in the long run. So right now, certification um, within DOD comes from certification of two separate processes. And one is of the system itself. So how that happens is that you have a group of technical area experts, TAEs. Um, they provide expertise in terms of um, prior experience or knowledge, or in terms of um, uh, looking at data uh, that's currently out there that the system has, has undergone or, or performed. So they'll look at that data, they'll take their ex own experiences and, and say whether or not a, a system is certified for use with um, a certified um, operator. So all of these things are certified for the use with an operator. And then sort of in parallel to that, um, there the certification of the pilot. So this comes from flight experience. So a certain number of hours that they have within the, the, this aircraft, um, uh, an oral board exam. And then basically they are allowed to fly if they, are, if they gain the trust from the commanding officer. So when I first learned about this, it was a little bit scary. So basically it's not, um, you know, a, a a precise number that they have to um, achieve or score on a test, but basically it's if the commanding officer thinks that the pilot is trustworthy, that they can trust them within any operating conditions, then they will be deemed uh, airworthy or ready to fly. And so there's the, these sort of two certification processes. So there's really right now an inherent I, not even a conflict, but um, we, we're not really quite sure how to reconcile these two things. If you take the pilot out of the loop, how do you then certify the system to fly when you don't have a pilot on board anymore? Um, and so that's kind of what we're trying to, to, to do here and to reconcile. Um, so I'll just uh, quickly, um, the picture on the right, the bottom right is a plane captain who is um, sort of directing uh, this fire scout, which is an autonomous helicopter on board a naval vessel um, as it's sort of preparing to take off. Okay, so I'm going to give a little bit of introduction, which I already did actually, um, talk about motivation background, um, the promise statement, and then the proposed methodology that we, myself and Bucket, have come up with to, um, to allow for certification of these large systems. Um, and within this myth, uh, methodology, there, um, there, we really sort of think about how do you generate certification evidence to allow for, for um, the, the sort of act uh, area experts to to gain trust and to allow for certification. Um, and then I'll go through some autonomous flight test data that is part of the certification evidence. And then at the very end, I'll quickly touch on some sort of uh, other work that um, uh, is a little bit tangential, but related to it as well. Use of UAVs is sort of increasing within the DOD. Um, there is currently um, a significant use with, with Triton, which is the sort of large fixed wing um, aircraft that the Navy has. And then Fire Scout, which you saw, which was a, an autonomous helicopter. Um, those are just two examples. Um, the These things may appear to be autonomous, but really their behavior is very deterministic in nature. Um, and it's and sort of been in, an operator, remotely piloted operator, or, or someone is actually ultimately responsible for operation of the craft. So it never really is truly autonomous. There are there are um, notions of automation involved. So it's similar to the notion of self-driving cars, where that um, these cars are certified for operation, but for autonomous operation, an op uh, a driver actually has to be in the car or is ultimately responsible for operation of that vehicle in and of itself. So automation is prevalent right now in naval aviation, um, but in order to get to uh, autonomy or autonomous systems, um, that's sort of next. And so um, 
this is a, an aircraft from the uh, 2005 movie called Stealth. I had actually never heard of it. Apparently it's very, it got very poor reviews on Rotten Tomatoes, but uh, uh, my student loved it um, being a test pilot. I'm, I'm sure that's one of the reasons behind it. But the before we can really allow Skynet to become self-aware, we actually have to determine a way to now certify that these um, work within mature systems. So in the fall of 2017, um, th this is really when the research kind of started. So Bucket um, was looking for a topic for his research and he needed to do something that was, um, uh, uh, he, that he was able to kind of work on with me, um, but also while he was deployed um, on an aircraft carrier circling, circling the globe. So um, this is work from NOC ID, um, uh, Center for Autonomy. So they were thinking, they were looking at this program called ACUS, which is, stands for Autonomous Aerial Cargo Utility System. Um, so this is the ACUS um, uh, uh, aircraft um, sort of flying right now. So this is an autonomous air, uh, helicopter that was able to, to sort of land and deliver cargo. So he was, um, he shadowed the ACUS program during the final design review and the final demo. And then from that um, system tried, uh, we're trying to think about how do you certify autonomous behavior within an already demonstrated naval system. Um, so they don't have to start from the ground up in terms of um, a, a new system already. So that's kind of where this uh, particular work came from. Okay. So um, I'll very, very quickly go through some background. Um, I, I skimped a little in terms of um, these are references that are not on this slide, but are available from this paper that we've written. Um, so the DOI is, is right here if you want to click on it. But this is no, by no means a comprehensive background lit review or anything like that. Um, there, But I just kind of want to touch on these things to give a little bit of a scope. Um, there's been a number of self-proposed approaches for certification for unmanned or autonomous systems. And most of these things deal with either small UAVs or theoretical models for large vehicles. Um, so current sort of safety of flight certification is designed to approve a system to be used by a fully qualified pilot again. So we hypothesize that before certification is granted for an autonomous system, that the system needs to demonstrate it can perform like a qualified pilot. Um, and complexity really is a barrier to this, but there's been you know, a number of papers dealing with modeling and simulation for these types of systems with informal methods for safety critical software. There's um, there's sort of um, work done in runtime verification, within model checking, within theorem proving. Um, and there's been work that talks about limitations of simulating a pilot's situational awareness. So again, by no means a comprehensive overview of the, of the work that's been done. These works though are, are rather limited in scope, not in terms of their contributions, but in terms of, let's say the uh, entire approved methodology. And really that's because these are difficult problems to tackle. Um, so they, they really look at one particular step within a methodology or, or one particular aspect of it. Um, they don't, also don't really consult with aviation certification officials. Um, uh, again, uh, they're by, by no means would, would they necessarily have to or, or um, am I faulting this, these works for doing so? Um, but uh, but our approach is, is in tandem or in conjunction with aviation certification officials um, to give it a more of a, um, uh, 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 a, a realistic flavor in that in that regard. Um, the one exception or, or one of the exceptions is from um, the formal methods group at NASA Langley. Uh, their work has been in obtaining flight clearances for UAS within the national airspace. Um, the slight difference is that their work sort of focuses on these objective standards. So an example would be uh, the UAS needs to maintain 1000 feet of separation, um, but they're not a uh, judgment task. So how do you certify that something is able to interpret the environment and make a best decision. That is a very uh, object, uh, non-objective um, standard to, to kind of do. So that's kind of where this, this work sort of sort of lies. And so um, NAVAIR or the Naval Air Systems Command was basically given the task of certifying or they are in charge of certifying all naval aviation systems safe for flight. And so this process is a uh, established risk mitigation process that assumes that a system will be operated by a qualified pilot or a qualified air vehicle operator um, in the case of UASs. So this pilot qualification process, again, is a trust process um, established by the commander of the Naval Air Forces or sometimes called the Air Boss. So they are, they are their role is basically to say whether or not a pilot is qualified um, 
And so if we want to take a pilot out of the loop or take a human out of the loop, we need a new process. And so this is an exercise in, in creating a methodology to certify an autonomous system to complete certain tasks. And because this is a very large problem, um, we're actually limiting the scope of this to a very um, a, a narrow scenario. So this is um, a confined um, air sort of landing or landing zone mission um, uh, that we're going to sort of follow out throughout this um, this work. So uh, it's it's simply determining a landing zone um, within a, a an area that might not necessarily have been prepared for a landing zone, and then landing the aircraft. And that's the the specific mission that we're taking a look at to tackle. So if this mission was successful, then we say that this aircraft is certified for that particular type of scenario right now. Okay, so this is the proposed methodology. So the first starts off with a, a, a requirements definition about what it is that the pilot needs to execute or that the system needs to execute. And then a definition of the flight envelope. So what things, um, uh, so here we're not doing things like collision avoidance. We're not dealing with um, you know, detection of, of uh, intruders or anything. We're really only thinking about um, uh, the, the landing, determination of a landing zone and then actually landing there. So that's what the, the, the flight envelope is taking a look at within this particular problem. Um, step three and step four is kind of the my, my bread and butter and what probably most um, folks within this session um, sort of really live in and live for is I was thinking about a formal methods approach in the developing protocol and control laws. This is sort of the, the what we're setting up for um, uh, in this in this particular thing, we're taking a look at the entire steps of what needs to be done, and then claiming that um, this is a nice setup for someone to come in and actually perform, you know, these heavy duty verification methods and development of protocol control laws. Um, and we can sit within these two steps. So after that comes modeling and simulation for risk reduction prior to any flight tests. And then step six and seven is something um, uh, where we think about the design process for flight tests. So um, so within, I'll explain a little bit more as we go along in later slides, but here, basically what we're doing is we're taking these sets of developmental tests and operational tests of the system to then go and say that after these tests are done, we'll go and say that um, the system is, is certified to be safe. And then once that happens, these reports of tests will conducted on the specifications and then delivered up to, um, to, to the air boss. Okay, so the first thing is that we um, define the requirements um, for some decision engine on board, some logic engine that has to be completed to be approved um, for this landing zone mission autonomously. Um, we'll develop a, some state machine specification to complete those requirements, analyze those specifications to ensure that it meets the requirements, um, and then develop a protocol um, for the software designers to use to program the system. These steps that we've done are, I claim, fairly trivial on our end to uh, in that um, what we've, we've sort of just scratched the surface. And so in no way am I claiming that these are these are very comprehensive ways of doing it. But again, we're sort of setting up the, the steps for it. Um, right, so, so steps one through four of this methodology really is thinking about generating evidence or creating artifacts that um, uh, that uh, sort of the area experts can can take a look at and then claim uh, or take a look at and then say that okay that that is enough for them to trust um, the process to then go and certify. Again, we're looking at this um, uh, mission, this landing zone mission where we have an unprepared confined area for landing and then we go and land. Um, we then basically use um, the notion of sweep, which stands stands for size, slope, wind, elevation, escape route, and power to determine whether or not these things, um, uh, uh, aircraft can actually can land, um, create these specifications, and then um, sort of go through formal method steps to do that, and then generate a protocol. Um, this is a, a screenshot of the paper. I'm not really quite sure. Uh, I thought it was a great idea when creating these slides to, to do this. I'm not really quite sure why. But this um, this first half of this work is in the Journal of Aerospace um, Information Systems um, uh, uh, here. Okay. All right, so in order to define the requirements, what we actually did was conducted a number of interviews with Naval officers um, to kind of figure out what it is that the system needed to do um, and then sort of wrote that down. Then we defined the flight envelope and the flight envelope was defined using the sweep method. Um, then we, we 
we spoke with um, folks at NASA Langley in terms of thinking about um, their formal methods approach and how they certified um, US for the national airspace. And then from that, that from there, we developed a protocol um, to satisfy these requirements. I, we don't actually develop control laws for this, but we did develop a protocol to satisfy them. But control laws could be developed um, if you're thinking about that. So this sort of sh up top shows an EMS that's landing on a particular freeway. This bottom picture shows this ACUS um, aircraft that was landing within a particular landing zone. So what we're trying to do here with the requirements definition for this particular mission is to, to come up with requirements for a judgment task. And the judgment task really is to determine whether or not the landing zone is safe and then land there. Um, this could be something as simple as um, landing on you know, the side of a highway, I claim that's simple, or something within an urban environment where you have to land between buildings. And so these, these are different scenarios that all fall within the, the task of, of what originally was a pilot. Um, uh, and there have been a number of sort of fatal mishaps, both military and civilian in these types of scenarios. And so we wanna be able to kind of, um, to address these, the, um, the, this particular application. Um, okay, so this is the, the the notion of sweep, and so it's a it's a checklist that currently um, is performed by helicopter aircraft commanders or, or hacks um, to complete this mission. So they first determine whether or not um, the size of the landing zone is appropriate for the vehicle that they're flying, um, and also the slope of the um, of of the ground in which they're trying to fly as well. So um, if you have uh, something that is too uh, too steep, um, the aircraft won't be able to land. Um, these uh, pictures sort of show different um, uh, perspectives from the helicopter pilot about their determination of um, of landing zones. And so here, this zone is too small. Um, on the right, the, uh, it's appropriate size landing zone from the pilot's perspective. Um, and uh, on the bottom, you see a an image that has different degrees of slope. Um, I, as a layperson, can't tell the difference between these degrees of slope, but a, uh, apparently it's very obvious to a, a, a pilot whether or not those are um, a nine degree versus a 12 degree slope. Um, and then here are two valid, on the right, two valid landing zones with obstructions and the obstructions are just cars in there. And then here is, on the bottom right is um, the, a helicopter, an ACUS, I believe, um, helicopter who that's able to kind of land on a rock. Um, so it's just sort of demonstrating the, the potential of what it's doing. So anyway, so these are the requirements definitions for them. Okay. Um, here we sort of show a state machine specification that satisfies the sweep um, requirements or definitions of the envelope. And this is sort of the final portion of the mission. So you start with an initial state, um, it goes through and conducts sweep checks to determine if the landing zone is a valid landing zone. Um, and you're always able to loop back if it turns out that there are some of these checks that aren't available. I won't get into the details of it too much because I wanna get uh, uh, talk about some of the flight tests later on. Um, but uh, you then build an ingress route which means that um, the decision engine builds um, whether or not it, it's able to kind of go and start landing. It monitors this, um, this sort of ingress and then it hovers over the landing zone transition. Um, and then it finally like uh, finally lands, it's safe, it's safe on deck. So these are the different state, this is the state machine for, for the um, uh, uh, sort of overall high level logic of, of the aircraft. Um, and every single time it sort of checks these um, conditions from sweep. Then we sort of go and again, I claim this is very hand wavy in the formal methods part, um, but I, this is kind of where um, uh, formal methods can be applied. So we actually went through and um, did a very sort of high level um, uh, uh, notion of, of, of um, proving that these specifications were satisfied using PVS, a theorem prover. So um, here we go and analyze specifications for consistency and completeness. Um, again, these are the sweet conditions to check for and these are this is sort of the the, the the state machine that we're looking at the specification and going through and monitoring um, these are the propositions that we're going through and checking again very trivial at a very high level um, but this is this gives um, uh, a notion of the types of certification evidence that um, can be generated that can be used for approval of these types of things. So um, these are propositions that were then just uh, checked within PBS and, and sort of very quickly to go through these. Um, and then after that 
um, comes a um, development of a protocol that basically translates these propositions into assessments. And these can get then get evaluated to verify that they um, all of these eight assessments would be a valid landing zone criteria. So again, may seem a trivial step in what we actually did for the problem itself, um, but this would, this would be considered an artifact for certifying autonomous behavior. So currently all flight clearances for naval aircraft and subsystems are are processed by this airworthiness process um, using approved techniques within NAVIR's manuals, right? So the evidence presented in this paper is not currently detailed in that manual, but we've actually submitted this to flight clearance officials for consideration for the next revision of the airworthiness process. So anything that you're able to, to do um, from a, a formal method standpoint that um, could be um, more rigorous than what we did here, um, can be sort of used to generate um, certification evidence in that regard. Okay, so the second part of this talk I wanted to, to kind of mention um, uh, is from flight tests for an autonomous system. So uh, this talks about both DT, which is developmental, and OT, which is sort of operational. So in this work, we are analyzing flight test data from these two types of tests, from an, from an autonomous decision engine um, that's, again, selecting an appropriate landing site. So we're basically using a legacy test and evaluation method to determine the suitability of an autonomous system for whether or not it would be approved. Um, so that's kind of what this, this is doing. So um, what we actually found was that the autonomous system under, under these tests were able to complete the mission under controlled conditions, but as soon as uh, it, it was confronted with conditions that were not anticipated or programmed, the software was not able to, um, to use the judgment that a pilot could use to complete the mission under off nominal conditions. And so again, we are taking a new autonomous system, this ACUS system that the Navy had demonstrated, uh, applying these test and evaluation flight test tests um, that the Navy currently has and seeing whether or not it would pass. And it turns out it wouldn't. So. Anyway, so this is the system under test. This is this ACUS um, uh, aircraft. And so ACUS has um, a uh, decision engine called Talos. It's called Tactical Aerial Logic Operating System, I believe. So this is the system. Um, it first goes through a series of developmental tests. And developmental tests just mean, is it able to perform under controlled conditions for a particular scenario? Um, once it goes through DT, then it goes to OT or operational tests. And this is where the tests are a little bit more vague. So there, the, the test could be go and uh, go and resupply um, uh, for, uh, go, go and resupply a certain thing to the, these Marines that are, who are located in this particular area. And that's all it's sort of given. Um, so we'll go through that and talk about results and talk about issues of situational awareness. Okay, so ACUS was an ONR, Office of Naval Research Funded Technology Demonstration Program that Aurora Flight Sciences was sort of the, the prime contractor on. Um, their decision engine was called Talos. It takes inputs from sensors and it makes decisions. Um, so this is a UH-1 that was outfitted with Talos and it flew under an FAA experimental certificate um, that required a safety pilot on board. The safety pilot um, uh, in, in, in essence was, was not supposed to, to take over unless something happened, right? Um, so this pilot was an engineering test pilot. Um, he had sort of experience working with automation, um, but but there was a lot of snake oil from the contractor, and don't quote me on that, in that it wasn't ready for prime time quite yet, but it was able to demonstrate everything that it had wanted to within a tightly controlled demonstration uh, box. Um, so they used sweep to define the flight envelope for what it was um, doing. It didn't it didn't look at wind or elevation or escape route or power, but it did landing zone sort of size and slope um, determination. Okay. All right, so that's what that is. Um, so there, the the final portion. Um, so the, so within the developmental test, um, this done. This uh, was done at Marine Corps, Corps Base in Quantico. There were six events or flights that happened. And it was, again, a demonstration of showing that it could sort of land uh, from a, uh, it could determine a, a spot to land and then land. So this was done in December 2017 to January 2018. Um, so, so this is an image of the landing zone that was determined by the, um, the decision engine. So everything in green is, is determined safe to land. Um, this is a ground level view of where it was landing. And this is sort of another view of the landing zone 
um, of the vehicle landing itself. So this image here just shows the, the vehicle building situational awareness about the landing zone as it's flying. Right now it's at 410 meters in elevation, 220 meters and 116. And so everything in green and teal are deemed to be um, no object seen and the area is safe for landing. So as it's landing, it's building situational awareness as it's going, going along. So here um, is, so the idea behind the, the sensors is that it should be able to identify any object that is over 18 inches. So this is a, a 18 inch Pelican um, case um, that uh, this Marine is holding. And so it should be able to identify any object of this particular size. Um, here, um, the landing zone is intentionally um, fouled by a golf cart. So there's a golf cart that comes in and uh, it should be, the system should be able to detect it and then um, uh, uh, abort the landing. And so that's actually what uh, is being done, I'll show you here with this video. So this is um, a poor junior engineer who was volunteered to drive a golf cart. Um, I myself would be very hesitant to drive a golf cart out underneath a helicopter that was autonomous and supposed to demonstrate it could view um, myself uh, before it landed. So it actually successfully did it so great. Um, Stellar driving by this junior engineer here um, to show that it was able to do that. Um, here is a video of uh, the aircraft actually landing. Um, so as it's landing, I'll sort of go through. It had uh, this, within the developmental test, there were 33 landings. There were four deficiencies, um, but these deficiencies were things that um, were, were deemed to be okay or, or overcomable. So the first thing was that um, there was a, a once the, the system identified a landing spot, it um, it would land there, whereas the safety pilot was actually able to, uh, I'm gonna skip through that. And here we come to landing. I'm gonna, nope. I'm gonna mute that. Um, the safety pilot was actually uh, able to determine that there was a better landing spot. Um, and so if he were the one actually operating, he would have landed in a different landing spot that was closer to you know, the Marines that needed the resupply, for instance. Um, but so future work would, would want to continuously assess these things. Um, so there's just some, some certain things that had issues, uh, but nothing that was detrimental to, to it overcoming it. So then um, once it, uh, We'll sort of satisfy these developmental tests. So the dog and pony show, we like to call it. Um, then it goes into the so OT or operational tests. And so um, these were um, flights that were done in 29 Palms, California, because the environment there was a little bit more um, similar to what um, would actually be done in real world conditions. So these were tests that were done in April or May of 2018 as part of an integrated training exercise. So this is 29 Palms out here. Um, the this were great in DVE or degraded visual environments. So they were concerned that the sensors weren't going to be able to pick up enough um, information to, for it to land when there's uh, you know, a lot of dust um, kicking around, but it worked great within a de degraded visual environment. Um, was able to perform to design missions under field conditions when everything happened as planned. So here it is sort of um, being able to resupply the Marines as planned. But um, there were some issues with the landing zones um, in certain things. And so here um, there was an issue with tumbleweeds or shrubs. So this is a Google Earth image of where uh, the aircraft was supposed to land. And this is what Talos, the decision engine, was seeing. So you can see these little red spots as places that um, uh, it, it was trying to land in. ACIS system, Talos system itself, was um, aborted the landing because they said it was too um, dangerous or it, there were obstacles in the, in the way. The safety pilot actually disagreed. The safety pilot was able to land because these were sort of shrubs and things that once the helicopter got closer would just blow away. Um, and so there were some discrepancies there um, in that. Okay, so this is just a test matrix, test matrix, not test matrix, that's kind of showing the different flights, um, a portion of it. There were 46 landings. Um, uh, 15 flights. Um, it wasn't really suitable for, for, for mission for a number of issues. So this green one here is the flight that uh, was basically the first successful resupply in the field. Um, this one here was unable to um, uh, to land or, or the safety pilot disagreed with the, the decision of the, of the autopilot because um, the, the Marines had actually put out sandbags on the ground to kind of demarcate where the landing zone should be. And the decision engine thought those were obstructions and decided not to land, whereas the safety pilot was able to land there. Um, in this one particular one here, there was, again, foliage um, that the aircraft did not was not able to kind of recognize and the safety pilot did and took over to kind of fly over. Um, so those were the kind of the results there. So 
so within the DTOT flight test results um, that were um, uh, flown from this autonomous aircraft, um, the, the mission can, were, was able to be completed under controlled conditions. It was unable to complete the mission when it encountered issues that were not pre-programmed or that required a pilot's judgment to, to, to complete. Um, some of these issues were determined to be issues with the vehicle situational awareness. So um, when sort of certifying um, the judgment of the pilot to perform these critical missions, um, experts agreed that the ACUS TALIS system didn't meet that threshold that they would have required um, it capable of meeting to um, for that that a, a qualified pilot should have been able to, to do. And so it passed DT, but it didn't pass OT. Um, one of the issues I just will briefly note was an issue of situational awareness. So here up top, um, there uh, sort of there were sort of some occasions in which uh, it led to a mishap and the pilot had to take over. So these the top um, were two different flights on two different days, and so you can notice that the trees over here. So um, when the aircraft was being the the decision was being trained, um, it did not sort of recognize these trees. Um, at, and so the, the, the pilot had to, to take over in order for it to fly above the trees or others that would have sort of flown within it. Um, you can see the road is right here. Um, so it didn't recognize it. it. Once the software was at, there was a delay that was added to let it process to, to determine whether or not there were trees, it was fine. But um, this was just one of the things that it wasn't able to kind of do. Okay. So the, the last, as we're sort of wrapping up, so that's kind of the, the process behind the methodology. The last sort of couple of things I want to mention, the first thing was in relating sensor degradation. So this is a third uh, paper that Buckner and I have done that was just published in the Journal of Aerospace Information Systems. Um, and the idea behind this is that as sensors degrade, um, there's a point in which those the situational awareness for those decisions are based off of inadequate um, information. And so here we're really trying to, to incorporate a pilot's perspective into how um, where exactly that that point of um, of degradation is going to be, and so this research really highlights the process of determining an objective measure for a subjective end as it relates to safety of flight certification. So that's kind of the the second this part here, and then this last part is um, a paper that um, I'd written two a couple of years ago on thinking about. Um, legal and ethical regulations. So how do you approach it from a regulator standpoint of what is ethical and what's legal to do? And so we sort of claim that, you know, the idea behind the trolley problem of how do you determine what's ethical for the car to, to, to veer into, you know, five people versus one person is not really the, the right question to ask, but really it's it's what are the objective measures? What are the, the, the non-objective measures? Um, and then what are the different um, uh, applications that you're looking at. And those applications will then sort of judge, determine the amount of regulation and the, the criteria that um, we're, we're taking a look at. Okay, so all of that, um, other things sort of tangential to this work, but this is just a beginning of a framework um, to really think about certifying large autonomous aircraft or even small um, autonomous systems as well um, that our community can actually play a, a big role in uh, in contributing to as um, uh, in generating these artifacts with these these certification evidence and always within this project particularly um, when we're, we're creating these systems um, we really want to think about the test pilots and think about the end users of these these test pilots are people that I've spoken to um, who are really counting on us to create systems that that are safe um, and create systems that um, are usable out in the real world. Um, I put these pictures here. Um, uh, Bucket is um, uh, one of my first PhD students that have graduated. Um, so I claim that he is uh, the first, your first PhD student is always your Simba, the one that you sort of hold up uh, and say like to the world, um, this is my creation. Um, he likes to consider himself Launchpad or Blue really from, from Disney. But um, anyway, so that's that's sort of how I want to end it. Um, just right on time, we have one more minute left. Um, anyway, so again, think of the test pilots, think of the end users as we're going along. Um, and I hope this is sort of a start to, the, to thinking about how we can certify large systems um, from, uh, from a regular oriented perspective. Thanks for Professor uh, Shu for uh, such an inspiring talk. It was uh, really great. Mm -hmm.